Well, folks, we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about the seven churches out of Revelation two and three, and uh, I thought that that might be a good one to, to just spend a little bit of time on because he talks about seven separate churches. Uh, when, if you remember, we started out with uh, we started out with uh, with Ephesians, and do you remember what? The problem with Ephesian, the Ephesian church was remember what, they had lost their first love, which was their love for Jesus. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. Because, to be honest with you, when we found out about the cancer, we thought at the time, and Chris and I sat and talked about it, and said, well, what, what's going on here? And we came to the conclusion that we felt that what God wanted us to do was go through this process and have the church go through it with us. In other words, pray with us, pray for us. Uh, in other words, the devil's trying to kill the pastor. Well, let's rise up and let's stop it. Amen. Let's have a time in the wilderness like Jesus had with the devil. And let him come at us in three different areas. And we'll, we'll stop him just like Jesus did. That's what Jesus gave us the ability to do, and so the you know so why is that important? You think? Well, it's important because hopefully what we're training you to do is when things get rough, when you have a time in your life that's not going the way you think it ought to be going, yeah. that's the time to include the Lord Jesus in your life and bring Him in. You see, what most people will do, they'll, they'll look to the world. And they'll look to and say, well, what's the world got? And to some degree, we see that in medicine, you know, with, with the chemo. I did a little research on the, on the internet, and I found out that the, the drug companies pay the, the doctors every time they recommend chemotherapy. They get paid. Did you know that? Okay, and a lot. I mean, like... Eight grand. That's why it's so. Huh? That's why it's so expensive. That's why it's so expensive because they pay them so much. Now, um, I'm all for taking advantage of everything that we have. And if there's a doctor out there that's got a good cure, or there's there's medicine out there, then uh, I'm I'm taking probably some unorthodox method, you know. Chocolate donuts with nuts don't have a great reputation for curing cancer. <laughs> they do make you happy. But they do make you happy. That's just correct. So we looked at we looked at the first church, which was Ephesus, and we found out that Christians, even though they're doing a lot of things, and remember Jesus had a lot of good things to say about the Ephesian church. They had good doctrine. They were getting along well together. But somehow, in the process, as they went along on their church, and it was a fairly new church, folks, but somehow as they went along, things changed, and people got into a position where they didn't feel the same way about each other as they did when they first became Christians. And so Jesus said the way to, to overcome that is when you lose that. In other words, basically what he's saying is you've lost your joy. You've lost your joy. So how do I get it back? Well, we go back to where we were when we lost it. Where were you when you when you lost it? You go back. Go back to that area. And it involves doing something else too. It involves repenting. When you lost your first love, and you're at a place where you just can't be nice to people anymore. What do you think that does to your witnessing? Now we're on the earth because God wanted some help. He wanted his people, his family, to be a part of the process. Amen? So guess what that means? It means you don't have the right to be nasty to somebody. You don't have the right to have a bad day. Did you have... Did God have a bad day when you accepted Jesus? No. Did you have to do anything special? No. 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 
Oh, you didn't. So let's look, and, and then we looked at the church of Sardis. Uh, if you remember what happened to Sardis, Jesus didn't have anything negative to say about that particular church because they were going through such a tough time of persecution. And remember, that was the time when the emperor was, they were gathering up all the Christians and they were throwing them in the arenas with the animals, the starving animals that were starving to death and, and, uh, and the animals were ripping up Christians. It was a terrible time. Uh, on fire. Huh? What they would do with Christians at that particular, they would have a, a function in the patio and they would take Christians and they would soak them in wax and then they would put them up on a pole and set them on fire. And that's the kind of stuff that was going on. And so, so Jesus didn't have a lot of negative things to say about the people of the Church of Sardi other than the fact that they were very faithful and they were very good about hanging in there uh, for their faith. In other words, he was proud. Jesus was proud for the way that they held on to their faith. Well, then comes a, a third church, the church at Pergamum. And so let's see what Jesus has to say. Remember, he's speaking to each of the churches now. And so he says in, in verse 10, um, write this letter. This should be right. This should be your first thing on your notes. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Pergamum. Now remember we were surmising that, you know, who was the angel of each of the churches? And we're surmising here, we don't really know, but a lot of theologians believe that we were speaking that Jesus put uh, some kind of angelic being in charge of each of the churches, and he's speaking to them. Because evidently that angelic being has some kind of authority. So he's speaking to that, that angel, Write the letter to the angel of the church of Pergamum. This is the message from the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. Who has the sharp two-edged sword? Jesus. And what is the sharp two-edged sword? The word of God. He goes on to say, I know that you live in the city where the great throne of Satan is located, and yet you have remained loyal. Now when he says you're located in the city where the great throne of Satan is, what does he mean by that? Rome. Huh? Rome. Well, yeah. What he means, what I'm looking for there, Buster, is this. The world. Yeah. yeah. In other words, when he's saying, he's calling the place that they're living and where they go to church the throne of Satan. So obviously they're doing things in the church that really don't go along with the way Jesus would like to run the church. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, that's why we want to take a look at this and see what some of these things are uh, so that we can do that. So, um, he says, but yet you remain loyal to me. And you refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my, favorite, my, my faithful witness, was martyred among you by Satan's followers. And yet I have a few complaints against you. Number one, you tolerate uh, some among you who are like Balaam, who showed Balak how to, how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to worship idols by eating food offered to idols and then by committing sexual sin. And in the same way, you have some Nicolaitans among you, people who follow the same teaching and commit the same sins. Repent, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth, which is the word of God. Anyone who is willing to hear should listen to the Spirit and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Everyone who is victorious will eat of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. So in other words, the, the characteristics that Jesus is talking about with the church at Pergamum is number one, a faithful witness to Jesus and moral purity among some of them. But some of them were sinning. Amen? You got that? And that's why sometimes we have, we have to deal with that in the church. And a lot of times we don't like to deal with it in the church. We always say that there's two ways we can handle, handle issues in the church. And one is through uh, being a peacekeeper and one is by being a peacemaker. Now Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 7 that we were peacemakers. Makers, amen? amen. 
Correct? Yes. All right. A peacemaker has to deal with issues, has to deal with life. You see, you can't sweep. A peacekeeper does what? Sweeps it under the rug, don't they? If I just don't deal with this issue, maybe it'll go away. And so when, pe when, when Jesus called us to be peacemakers, basically what he was saying was, is you're going to have to get in there once in a while and get your, your hands dirty. You're going to have to deal with issues in the church. Now, what we've done, sometimes we go a little too far and we make the church a place, well, let's call it a place of, uh, you know, where, where we kick people out. We shun them. Where do we get that? Uh, huh? The Pharisees. Okay. Actually, it goes a little, a little earlier than that. Even. It goes back to the time of the Old Testament when pretty much everything that we could do in the law, uh, under the law, it was covered. And if you committed a sin under the law of the Old Testament, what happened? You had to be stoned to death. You were killed. Okay? And so... We, but, but one of the byproducts of that particular process is we got into a situation where people were going around looking, trying to figure out what sin people were committing so we could kick them out of the church. Now, let me just say this. It's important that as a leader in the church, Randy and I discuss this all the time. We have other pastors from the Titus Task Force group who we worked with over the years, who work with us still regarding if we have, if we have, uh, if we want to talk about something, if we have an issue, if we need advice on something, how do we handle the situation? And of course, generally what you do, the, the, the rule always is how do we handle the situation? You do what the Bible says to do. Amen? Amen. Okay, how did the Bible say to handle it? I remember one time we were dealing with someone and this person was a terribly contentious person. You couldn't say good morning to them if they didn't get mad. You know? <laughs> and so we're dealing with this person and, and uh, uh, so so uh, finally I just said, you know what we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do some, the church is gonna have to do some discipline on the on this person because they just won't they won't listen. Uh, and they're just cantankerous. And so then, uh, so we were talking about the issue, and I said, well, we're going to have to let this person, and so somebody said, well, the Bible says that uh, uh, when you're dealing with a contentious person, you know, that you, that if you lose a person in the church and, and they get mad, you go after them and you try to save them. That's, that's what it says, go after the lost sheep. So the Bible says go after a lost sheep. I said, that's exactly true. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, go after contentious sheep. Yeah. So, here's what I'm saying, folks. What we don't want to be is the church that kicks everybody out. Right. Okay? We're not going to be looking over everybody's shoulder. Someone said to me not too long ago, I've been in the church for 30 years. And I know when somebody's in sin or not. God has given me the ability to know when someone's in sin. Yeah. Okay, what's wrong with that statement? <laughs> That's not our job. Ah, it's not our job. Do you think God really does that? Do you think God is sitting up there saying, oh, you know, here's some bunch of stuff that Pastor Bill has done, you know? I'm going to just share all of this stuff with Skeeter and let Skeeter call him on the phone and give him a bad time. No. It's never going to happen. Is it? It's never going to happen with anybody else because that's not the way God works. What we need to understand is how he works and how he works with his people. Okay? And so, if we would have entered the city of Pergamum at the time, um, it was, in this particular time, it was the capital of Asia. We might have found that this city was so beautiful. It was just gorgeous. It was just one of those places on the side, but you know, with, with the nice beach and the, 
and, and, and the water all around it and so forth. It was a great place to live. They had churches. It was built on a rocky hill uh, where the Mediterranean could be seen on a clear day. The other thing about Pergamum, it was a culture center. Okay. Like Pismo Beach. Like Pismo Beach, but different in the sense that it was more like more like uh, where the Reagan Library is because they were famous for its library. It had a library, it had scholars, uh, it had people who were really into, into scholastic uh, achievements. And uh, it probably, I think it's, it's safe, we could say Pergamum attracted some of the finest minds in the academic world. Now, I want you to draw a parallel with this. Do we have a parallel with this uh, in today's world? San Francisco. Well, we do San Francisco, and, we, and, and all those, the situations we see with the, the thing that, that just blew me away here this week was the thousand high school students that had to take a couple of days off after the election because the results of the election were just so dramatic they just couldn't go to high school for two or three days, you know. Or college. Or college. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of, there were some similarities with Pergamum in that. And, and um, they had the finest minds in the academic world. Okay. So, but Jesus didn't write to the professors of the institutions. Who was he writing to? He was writing to the Christians and the people that were involved in his church. And uh, he wrote to Christians struggling to keep their faith amidst the critics of higher learning. Do we have critics of higher learning that criticize us in the church today? Oh. Because of politics? And Jesus himself referred to Pergamum as Satan's city. Now the reason he called it that is because of what was going on. Like San Francisco. Like San Francisco. I'm not, I'm not liking It's like San Francisco Buster, but I'm not going to draw the analogy that it, because I'm not going to tie it to... Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to tie that to the gay issue uh, in particular. Okay, so the believers of that city, then of Pergamum, must have been like the Christians today, who sit in classrooms and listen to the learned professors scoff at Christian beliefs and, and undercut their values. Now, they were commended. I, I think this is interesting because Jesus, I mean, he ripped some of the other churches, but he commended Pergamum here because he said, that um, you remain true to my name, you did not renounce your faith in me, and even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, what happened to Antipas is he was one of, one of Paul's uh, witnesses, and he was a martyr, they killed him. They took him and they threw him in a pot and they roasted him slowly in the pot until he was dead. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that was going on uh, back in those days. And uh, so he said, uh, he said, you know, I've got, Jesus said to the churches, I've got a few things against you. And it's probably a lot of the Pergamum believers probably looked at each other and, and, and shrugged their shoulders and said, what, do you, what is it that we've done? What have we done? Well, they had become compromisers. And this is the message I want you to see today. Have you become a compromiser? Whenever it comes to your Christian values and your Christian beliefs, are there any of those things that you compromise? I thought about this. I've been watching it but without getting into politics. But to a degree, watching the pundits try to explain why the polls didn't work. And one of the reasons they came up with, with it is the fact that there were a ton of people out there who were getting phone calls who will not take the phone call and will not admit that they're going to go vote. Your pastor is one of those people. And I have little things on my telephone that, can, that I can tell if it's a, if it's a call that's, that's on, a, on a line that they're calling over and over and over again. My telephone lets me know. It only rings one time and then it won't ring anymore. And it'll never let that call call me back. What a terrible thing to have on your phone. 
You can't get a telemarketer phone call. Isn't that awful? Yeah. What an awful pastor I must be. You must be lonely. I, I yeah, I, I get lonely, Buster. I you because know, I don't get any of the, I don't get any of the telemarketer calls anymore. And uh, and, and yes, yes, yes. And so. Uh, so that, that's one of the things I want you to see. In other words, in other words, to the, the other thing is, is that when God is working in church, like he's working in, how many know that he's working in this church? I mean, I, I've asked you to say that many times. We've all seen it. All right. Well, when that begins to happen, what do you think that opens the door for? What? Uh-huh. Exactly. And... What's doing it? In other words, what what's God doing within the church that is so exciting? He's building relationships among each and every one of us with each other. Yep. Okay? Because what's Christianity about? Relationships. What's the most important commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The most important commandment is about relationships with God, people, and ourselves. And that's why it's important when we run into problems that we begin to look to God. That's why I think this exercise was given to us as a church. God can heal anybody he wants to heal. You know, I said in Facebook, I mean, I gave my life to Jesus 50 years ago. So, I mean, either he's my Lord or he's not my Lord. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, what difference does it make? Whether I want to be here or whether God's going to take me out, it doesn't make any difference because, I mean, it's God's call. It's the Lord's call. It's Jesus' call. What's the best thing for his church? And my job as the pastor is to pull us all together as a congregation and learn to come together so that we can determine what it is that Jesus wants to do. Now, Amen. Pastor Bill's not going to determine that because he doesn't have the ability to determine that. Mm -hmm. But it's taken Randy and I probably two years to really get to a place where we know each other and, and trust each other. But now every once in a while, we'll be talking about something and Randy will say, well, what about this? Or how about this? Or we need, we need this. Or we need a check for this uh, because so-and-so needs to be shown that God's involved in this, you know. And we're learning more and more how to head off. In other words, what the devil does is when he comes at the body, he's going to get us fighting among ourselves. Amen? Amen. And so what it is, is, is we're going to see somebody do something. Or we're going to see some sin in somebody's life. And it's going to offend us. Now, I'm not saying that it shouldn't offend us. But what I'm saying is, is, is that there is a time... For church leadership to do church discipline and there's a time to be tolerant and there's a time to accept everybody for who they are especially when they're just coming to church for the first time amen, amen. okay and so that's now uh, and there are there are bible verses there's a bible verse in Timothy if I've got a if I've got an elder uh, in the church who is cantankerous contentious and will not take instruction. I mean, Timothy says, call the elder out from the pulpit. I mean, how would you like that, guys, if I did that from time to time? I've seen it done. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it done many times where it's been more of a negative effect than a positive effect because it looked like the church was kicking somebody out. Okay. And again... Um, that's not the mentality that we want to be in. So, that brings me to a good point. In each of these churches that we're talking about, like with Ephesus, they lost their first love, with Pergamum, they became enamored with pagan practices in, basically what they're talking about here in Pergamum is sex. Okay, you had, you had situations where there was a lot of sex going on in the service. Remember, the Temple of Diana uh, uh, in Ephesus, every woman had to spend a year as a cult prostitute uh, uh, in the church. 
So that was a big part of it. So basically what Jesus is showing, the Ephesian church had lost its first love. In Smyrna, the cruelty of Satan came on the church with such force. I mean, there wasn't anything bad that, that happened because, I mean, they just, I mean, what they were doing to the Christians was just awful. Uh, and so it was under tremendous persecution. And in Pergamum, Satan used the same approach that Balaam used against Israel. Now, I want to take a moment and I want to share with you what happened to the country of Israel and what Balaam did. We all, I think a lot of us know the story of Balaam. And Balaam was a prophet who basically boasted that he could influence the gods for and against men by his incantations and his offerings and all the religious stuff that he did. He could influence the pagan gods. He ran a wholesale business for divine favors, and basically he charged them for that. So Balak, king of Moab, offered Balaam a nice prophet if he could bring down a curse on the king's demised enemies of Israel. So in other words, the king of Israel had these enemies, and he gets hooked up with Balaam, and he says, you know what? I think that's a great idea. You go ahead and curse the nation of Israel, and then that way they'll have a nice curse on them, and, and I'll be a happy king. Well, <laughs> Balaam tried to command God, but instead of a curse, Israel was blessed. God went ahead and blessed Israel and just blatantly showed the king that Balaam wasn't as strong as he thought he was. So frustrated by his, his failure to get what he wanted, he showed the king, Balak, how he could corrupt Israel by having the adulterous Moabite women seduce the Israelite men. So he tried to put the curse down on Israel, but it didn't work. And uh, so he said, fine. He says, I know how to make it work. We'll get the men hooked up with all the pagan women and get, because they're already worshiping the pagan religion, right? And so they automatically bring these pagan practices into the, <coughs> right into the church. And so that's how they, and he hooked up the, the guys with, with the pagan gals. Okay? And uh, so people who call themselves Christians, people who are committing <coughs> adultery, uh, people who cheat in business, people who lower their moral standard to suit the situation, these are the people who fit into the Pergamum church mentality. Does that help? They had a tendency to slip on the sexual practices. And I think that that's something that I'm really concerned about. I, mean, I have people in my family, my own family right now. And uh, something that was said the other day, and, and it bothers me. And uh, my daughter said it. And she said, uh, we have to, my daughter just moved in with Teresa and I, and, move Brady back in and her son and, and, and her daughter is with us, living with us. And she said, I've got to get back. We've got to get moved in. I've got to be there to help dad because God is killing my dad. He can't say. Now, that bothers me. What I feel like at this stage of my game. My daughter is 45 years old. Is that right, Teresa? She's 45 years old. And yet, still looking for worldly things. If, if things get rough, if life gets tough, I'll just have a couple of shots of, of vodka. I'll have some prescription drugs. I'll do whatever it takes so that I don't have to cope with life. What's the message of our church, folks? God has given us so much in the way of dealing with life that he's given us everything that we need to have a successful life. Yes, 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 yes. yes.
So the sin, basically, of the city of Pergamum was that, and basically it was the same sin as Balaam, it was the toleration of evil in the lifestyle of people. Now, that brings us to an interesting place. And as your pastor, it brings Randy and I to an interesting place. How do we handle this? How tough do we get when someone's really blatantly in sin? And I've had people call me on the telephone and say to me, you know, you're teaching grace versus legalism. I grew up in a legalistic church, so therefore I don't agree with what you're teaching on grace. I agree with the legalism. One of the things I've said is that if we become too legalistic, we will chase everybody out. We won't win anybody to Christ. That's true. And that's one of the things that Randy and I are constantly talking. How far do we, how far do we go? How much discipline do we take? How much grace do we admit? And Randy has said this at least a dozen times from the pulpit, and I've said it as well. When it comes down to a place where we're having to decide whether to be in grace or to be in legalism, we're going to choose to be in grace. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You sure that's not going to make you mad? No. We'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. Yeah. And uh, hopefully with me while we're having coffee. Okay. So, so um, that's basically what he's talking about when he talks about Pergamum. He's talking about a church that basically muddied up the Christian commitment with compromise. You see that? In other words, church attendance was at an all-time low. Church giving was down by over 50%. We go through that all the time. That's, in fact, we're going through a process of that right now. We're down. Sometimes it's been up as high as $1,800, $2,000 a Sunday. Lately, it's been off. It's been down between about $800, sometimes $500. I don't know why the difference. And, and does it make any difference? Not really. Because Teresa and I don't touch it anyway. I mean, it goes into the bank account. Billy Sue takes care of it. She's the banker. She's vice president of the bank. And so we've got people, and then we've got other Christian people that are on it as well. We've got some of our, our members of our church also sign on it. Teresa and I do not sign on it. We don't want to sign on it. And I don't look at the checks to see who's giving and who's not giving. Because I don't want my relationship with you to be based on what you're giving and what you're not giving. Right. Okay? So the big problem with Pergamum was it was married to the world. Now Jesus does give them a couple of great promises. He says, he calls for their repentance. And then he gives two promises. He says, I will give some of the hidden manna. Okay. Now does that ring a bell with you when I say he promises to give manna? That, well, what is manna? What, what was the purpose of it? Fruit of the Spirit. Aha, uh -huh. it was the food of the Spirit. He said, I will give hidden manna, and I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Hidden manna. Now, what I want you to begin to see is we get these hints over and over and over constantly in the Bible. <clears throat> And what Jesus is saying here, why is this important? Why is it important that he will give somebody a white stone with a new name written on it? Why do you think that is? What was going on in the Old Testament? Well, in ancient courts, the white and black stones signifying the verdicts of juries. And so, a black stone meant guilty, a white stone meant acquittal. What did he say he was going to give everybody? A white stone with a new name on it. 
You see how all of this begins to tie into the cross? And how we, in the hundreds of years that our churches have been, our tradition, our church tradition has come across one way, but really what Jesus was doing was something else. What he was doing was empowering us as a congregation, not only to live together in harmony and peace, but to help each other meet each other's needs. Make sense? Because what happens, and, and you, many of you have told me this so many times, so much of the world is in the church, and so many of the churches are in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's just no difference between the two. And that's one of the things that your pastor, both of your pastors, are working hard. That's we're very concerned about this. But sometimes we catch it wrong. Not everybody wants to hear that they need to examine their heart to see if they're in the faith. How many would like to hear that this morning? How many would like me to come to each of you and tell you, you know, you need to pray more and be a better Christian? How many would really like to hear that? How many would not like to hear it? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Most of us don't want to hear it. So basically, the early part of the church's life, the Pergamum church was married to the world. Political and civil authorities now applauded. Now isn't this interesting? Remember what happened in Sardis? What was happening to the Christians? They were dipping them in oil and then putting them on a pole and setting them on fire and letting them be the candles for the, the lighting uh, for the, uh, the party that, that night. What happened? Well, now all of a sudden, the emperor, the political, the politicians, now they're applauding true believers. And they're saying that what the believers are doing is right. It's correct. Now we're in a new, new age, remember? The Sardis was a separate church age, the ch age, the church age of persecution, and it was about 150 to 200 years that that happened. Then came the time for the Church of Pergamum. The theologians call that the Pergamum uh, set. That lasted for a couple of hundred years. And the Emperor Constantine declared that Christianity was to be the true religion of the state. Now I have to tell you, he was not a Christian. And what he was doing is he was mixing pagan religion in with Christianity. So you have all of these pagan rites and pagan practices that were going on in Christianity. And Constantine assumed leadership of the church. And these pagan temples became Christian churches. Mm -hmm. Heathen festivals were converted into Christian ones. What is Christmas itself? Oh, well, he was, Jesus was born on December 25th. No, he wasn't. He was born in the spring. Right. Just no excuse to buy gifts. It was an excuse to get together and have a holiday because there was a major pagan holiday going on at the time. And of course the Christmas trees, all of that became part. We got into a situation in, in, in Montana and they had a they had a Christmas tree and one of the members of the church uh, had allergies. And, the, and, and they brought it, whoever brought the Christmas tree and brought in the Christmas tree and then brought in, what, what are the flowers? Um, poinsettias. Huh? Poinsettias. Poinsettias. And they were, they were deathly sick. You know, and I mean, one smell of it. But the guy who brought the poinsettias in wouldn't give in. By God, that's what we do for Christmas. And by God, whether you get sick or not, you're going to put up with it. <laughs> And the whole thing is the pastor's fault because it was his idea that we do this stuff to begin with. It's good, and, and so that's the kind of stuff we get into. And that's why this kind of teaching is good because it helps us to realize where we're coming from and, and, and really what's important to us. Okay. Guys, I'm going to stop here. And then uh, next, next Sunday we'll get into the church of Thyatira. 
Um, but does this help? Does this give you an understanding of, Amen. Of, yeah. uh, uh, of what's going on here? And that's basically what we have to do, folks. Yes, we have to watch ourselves. Certain things, if the Bible says something is sin, it's sin. And we shouldn't be doing it. But we're not going to lose our salvation because we sin. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay? But here's the key. What motivates us? Our love of Christ. Amen. Amen. See? And that's where the church at Ephesus got off. Other things became more important than relationships with each other. And that's what we want to watch. And that's what we want to make sure that we're not doing here at Brandon Heart Fellowship. Amen? Amen. You guys, you are doing it. You are. I've never been proud of the church in my life. And I am everyone. And... Uh, it just, it's sometimes I, it's unbelievable that I sit here and that God would call me to, to pastor this church and to pastor you and to be your pastor. So thank you for that opportunity. And uh, continue to pray. Amen. Pastor? As you know, we had the election and everything, we prayed for our leaders. We had the election and everything, they prayed for our leaders. Oh, yeah. Uh, Buster had a good idea, and, and I'm, we won't do it this morning, but continue to pray for your leaders, your, your, your political leaders. Uh, and boy, there's just, boy, some of the stuff I'm seeing on television is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, I'm talking about some sore losers. Yeah. So, anyway, with that, 